In every age, the top killers have always had the best hardware. The Predator certainly must have been a kickboxing nightmare. It had those very powerful jaws with thick, powerful teeth. But it was built to bite and hang on. Over the millennia, their evolution has been one long experiment in how to kill. Everything is just a mathematical formula when it comes to a predatory attack. And in the arms race between predator and prey, great weapons never die. They're endlessly recycled, lethal reminders of prehistoric assassins. Since life began, the game of survival has been kill or be killed, eat or be eaten. And if killing means surviving, you become very good at it. What we see is this escalation between predator and prey. The prey develops anti-predator devices, and consequently, the predators are faced with a new evolutionary challenge. And so they themselves become that much more adapted to uh, sort of the new wrinkles that the, the prey has evolved. Crushing jaws, eviscerating fangs, bloodletting venom. These will always be in the killer's toolkit. And nature's tendency to recycle these traits is called convergent evolution. And convergent evolution is really cool because it's evolution having a solution that works in a bunch of different cases. And the solution here is, how do you make a living? Each of these tools was honed by a pioneering ancestor. Like the killing claw. Its owner, Deinonychus, was a fast, efficient killing machine. And with this pair of sickle-shaped talons, Deinonychus could not only slash, but also disembowel its prey. This close relative to the Velociraptor was 11 feet long and weighed in at over 150 pounds. It had large clawed hands and powerful jaws lined with 60 blade-like teeth. But it was Deinonychus's monstrous talons on its hind feet that were its signature killing tool. And this is almost certainly the main weapon of Deinonychus. In fact, this feature is so important that it explains the animal's name because Deinonychus means terrible claw. Deinonychus stalked fertile deltas, forests, and lagoons in what is now Montana, Wyoming, and Oklahoma from around 115 to 108 million years ago. It was inhabiting a large range of the continental United States, therefore living in various different habitats and presumably exploiting quite diverse prey, everything from small animals all the way up to large dinosaurs. So it seems to have been a superb generalist. You should imagine it as something like a cross between a hawk and a wolf, if you like. Despite its modest size, it used its talons to shred just about everything in its environment. Imagine the pack-hunting raptors from Jurassic Park with their massive bird-like claws. That's Deinonychus, and the bird-like comparison was apt. The very first predators to develop curved claws for traction and grasping were tetrapods, amphibians that ventured on land over 360 million years ago. 210 million years later, lethal new killers emerged. Dromaeosaurs, bird-like but flightless predatory dinosaurs. Also known as raptors, their claws were their ultimate killing tools. Today, killing claws can still be found on raptors, birds like hawks and eagles that use their claws to pierce and crush their prey. The things that you can tell about evolution that work are the, are the designs that get repeated. The classic sickle-shaped claw is repeated all over the place. You see it in dinosaurs for sure, and then you see it in animals in the last 65 million years, things like Smilodon, things that are taking down prey with their arms. So that claw shape seems to be very effective, and it's been 
repeatedly converged upon by evolution many, many times. And like some of today's birds, Denonychus may have maximized the impact of their claws by hunting in packs. Birds hunt cooperatively, and there's every reason to think that, uh, that raptors probably did too. They were very large-brained animals, uh, and they were very active uh, predators. This cooperation would have allowed Denonychus to take down much larger prey, like the plant-eating Tenontosaurus. Now, this wasn't a particularly easy animal to kill. If you imagine it's about five to six meters long, it probably weighs about a ton. It's got an incredibly long muscular tail. It's got long, powerful hind limbs with four quite long, dangerous claws. So killing it isn't going to be easy. The Denonychus pack may have used a ruthless diversionary strategy to outwit its much larger foe. Imagine a large group splitting up into small groups of two and three. Denonychus would have moved in with surprising speed. Maybe this is when some individuals went ahead to try and block its escape from a certain area. Maybe the ones from behind or the sides came in to attack. And Denonychus's hind limbs also carried the heavy weaponry, the claws. The second digit of the foot had a very large sickle-shaped claw, and it would hold that claw up and out of the way when it was running, so it wouldn't really run on that toe. Then when it would get into a situation where it was attacking, it would, uh, uh, it would flex that, uh, that claw and, and use it to slash. Paleontologist Larry Whitmer and his students study a variety of claws to understand how they worked. If we look at the legs of, of dromaeosaurs like Deinonychus or its more famous Asian cousin, Velociraptor, and you can see it's got a couple of toes on the ground, but it's got this crazy little claw raised up right there. And we think that this was actually a very powerful weapon. By contrast, modern raptorial birds like hawks have four talons on each foot, all at the same height. Raptors like this hawk are not using their feet to run around on the ground very much. Sure, they can hop around, but basically they're flying around and using all four of these little toes basically as weapons. So the prey would be uh, brought into the foot like that, then they would contract these muscles back here that sort of operate the foot by remote control. So if I pull on these muscles, we can see how the toe will actually clamp around. Because they fly, birds' talons don't become dull from contact with the ground. But Denonychus kept just one talon razor sharp for killing while running on its other three toes. An animal that indeed is running around on this hind leg isn't going to be able to keep all of these claws so sharp. And that's sort of the beauty of what we see in something like Deinonychus or Velociraptor. Once in battle, Denonychus would grasp with its forelimbs while using the blades on its hind limbs to inflict the heaviest damage, literally thrashing and pummeling its prey to death. Deinonychus certainly must have been a very efficient killing machine, a kickboxing uh, nightmare. The hand claws are used for latching onto prey. The hind foot claws are often used in actually making raking, disemboweling movements. And it's quite possible that that does explain the actual function of the Deinonychus claws. Once the prey was disemboweled, the pack would have torn it further apart using their teeth. Deinonychus had about 60 teeth, and they appear very well suited for ripping into flesh, removing chunks of flesh from prey. Though raptorial birds continue to crush and tear prey with their talons to this day, Deinonychus vanished 100 million years ago. While claws are good at ripping prey to death, 
another predator dove into its prey, head first. Headhunter. In the animal kingdom, the term refers to a predator with a head as its dominant weapon. The most lethal assassins of all time, the Tyrannosaurids, or tyrant dinosaurs, took this killing style to the limit. Displetosaurus combined both brute force and, for their size, great speed. Displetosaurus was certainly built for heavy combat. It was, it was built to uh, bite and hang on. Despletosaurus, a 30-foot-long, 4 to 6,000-pound Tyrannosaurid, didn't use its small clawed forelimbs to grasp or kill. It attacked and slaughtered prey exclusively with its lethal cranium. This massive skull, measuring over one meter in length, was heavily constructed with fused nasal bones for added strength, and Despletosaurus's long muscular legs quickly got the heavy weaponry to its target. It had a shorter and more massively muscled neck to power those very large jaws, and it had those very powerful jaws with thick, powerful teeth. It was therefore able to take out bigger and stronger plant eaters than most of its rivals. Despletosaurus took a giant evolutionary step forward for Tyrannosaurids. Prompted by the need to compete for bigger, more aggressive prey, it became stronger. It's the first of the robust, or that is, heavily built, of the tyrant dinosaurs. After Despletosaurus is around, we see much larger and even more heavily built tyrant dinosaurs. Despletosaurus lived from 80 to 73 million years ago and dominated fertile floodplains, ranging from what is now Canada down to Montana. It had a lethal combination of power and speed. You have an animal that's uh, capable of the, uh, the rough and tumble life of a Tyrannosaurus rex, and yet it has the agility that you also associate with some of the smaller Tyrannosaurs. Power, speed, and its headhunting killing style allowed Despletosaurus to cut a swath of destruction throughout the late Cretaceous period, an era rich with herbivores like Corythosaurus. Despletosaurus, like most predators today, would have been cruising its environment looking for a potential victim. But not just looking with its eyes, but it also had a phenomenal nose. So whether it's the scent of a plant eater or the sight of one moving on in the distance, it would latch on and say, aha, I see a victim there. But a 5,000 pound predator can't stay hidden forever. And at this moment, crashing toward its prey, Despletosaurus's long runner's legs turned on the speed. This lightly built leg and, and fairly mobile elongate foot would have allowed uh, Despletosaurus to run very quickly. It would have been faster than the duckbill dinosaurs and the horned dinosaurs that it was trying to kill and eat. But how did it grab onto a huge fleeing corythosaur and subdue it? Certainly not with its short arms. The tyrant dinosaurs have dinky little arms. They're very famous for that. They can't even reach their teeth with their own hands. As you can see here, this is the scapula, the humerus, and the hand, which corresponds to the same bones on my body here. And you can see that the, the arm is no bigger than mine. Put my size arms on you know, a rhino-sized animal, uh, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. So why did Despletosaurus have such tiny little arms if they couldn't do anything? Evolution favored those tyrannosaurs with smaller and smaller arms, until eventually you had a creature where most of the power is in the head and essentially none of the power is in the forearms. According to scientists, nature was investing all its energy to develop that lethal head at the expense of arms, which were being phased out. I would imagine if the great asteroid hadn't hit 65 and a half million years ago, that the tyrannosaurs that lived 20 million, 30 million, 40 million years after Despletosaurus may have lost those forearms altogether. They may have been totally armless. 
As Displetosaurus closed the gap on its prey, the jaws on its solid, massive head would clamp on like a vise. Those skulls are doing double duty. They're both the killing weapons, but they're also the holding weapons. And this powerful weapon was also lined with enormously long teeth. Firmly anchored into the gums, they had twice as much root as crown, the tooth top that inflicts damage. Those teeth could twist and turn from side to side. And on top of that, if you look at the shape of the tooth, they were more like railroad spikes. They're for stabbing, they're for puncturing, they're for crushing, and they're also for holding. A bone crusher. Despletosaurus was a voracious eater. Those powerful jaws would clamp down, pulverize muscle, break through bone, and cripple the plant eater so the Despletosaurus could be eating the plant eater while it's still alive. Despletosaurus made quick work of its plant eating neighbors. And yet, after seven million years as an apex assassin, it vanished from the earth driven into extinction by bigger, faster, more powerful tyrant dinosaurs. Displetosaurus was a victim of its own success. That is, uh, in evolutionary history, often you evolve yourself into extinction. That is, you produce descendants that have acquired more and more specializations than you have as a species that then outcompetes you. And though there are no longer Tyrannosaurids stalking the Earth, there were plenty of heirs to this hunting style, a deadly example of convergent evolution in action. The dogs and the hyenas are pretty good analogs to the tyrant dinosaurs like Despletosaurus. When a dog, like a wolf or a hyena, goes after a victim, it clamps down with those jaws, and it doesn't use those claws on its paws so much to kill its victim. It might use it to brace itself, but that's about it. Big-headed Despletosaurus was a large predator of its day, but a diminutive later cousin used a similar body type to kill prey in a different manner. Squat and built like a pit bull, it could consume just about anything. Getting chased by a seven-foot-tall, 3,000-pound pit bull is one very effective way to end up dead. From 65 to 70 million years ago, Majungasaurus was the largest predator living on the island of Madagascar. Yet Majungasaurus was small compared to Tyrannosaurids, such as the head-hunting Despletosaurus. So Majungasaurus had to use its entire body as a weapon, a giant attack dog. This predator with a blunt snout and a wide skull was built for power because it didn't have size. It had a strong muscular neck, interlocking ribs, and short sturdy legs, all used to support its powerful skull containing a flexible lower jaw and 34 short, brutish teeth. It really was quite a low animal, yet certainly one that you wouldn't want to meet in a back alley. Benefiting from its pit bull build, Majungasaurus was part of a continuum among the theropod dinosaurs. Bipedal, sharp-clawed, big-headed, and toothy. Majungasaurus simply refined all of this into a stout, small, and vicious package. And its environment was equally brutal. During the late Cretaceous, Madagascar experienced crippling seasonal drought, and this decimated the flora that giant sauropod herbivores fed on. But their misfortune was Majungasaurus's bonanza. It would be at these times that other dinosaurs, the, the large sauropods that shared its ecosystem, these animals would be weakened. And that might be a very lucky place for Majungasaurus to be. Here on the desolate, rain-starved plains, Majungasaurus would have snuck in close to its prey, the giant sauropod, Ropetosaurus. The killer's short limbs meant that it had a short stride. Not good for distance running, but for short bursts of acceleration. So Majungasaurus needed to get close enough for an ambush. <laughs> 
but how would it have attacked something much more massive than itself? It has been speculated that Majungasaurus might have been a bite and hold predator. In other words, not like Tyrannosaurus that had long teeth that could cause great gouges or gashes in, in a prey item, but one that would actually use its relatively short teeth just to hold on. Lower to the ground than the giant sauropod, it may have surged up at its prey's throat and clamped on with its short teeth. The killer's jaws were designed for desperate struggles like this. If you look at the skull of Majungasaurus, it's not built like a Tyrannosaurus skull. It's not long, it's not narrow. Uh, instead, it's quite short, but it's also quite broad. That style of skull indicates uh, resistance to torsional movements, in other words, bending of the skull during predation. It could hang on long enough to inflict a mortal wound without having its own skull torn apart in the struggle. But Majungasaurus was not particular about how it got a meal. An extreme drought offered another option. We also know for a fact that this animal didn't only act as a predator, it was a scavenger. It certainly fed on the dead. And even in this case, its powerful build would come in handy. If you are making at least part of your living on the dead, you might as well have the capability of kind of working a sauropod carcass, which is a very large thing to have to move and feed and, and push things out of the way. And so being robust, being strong, could arguably be beneficial in that type of situation. This ruthless pit bull of a predator's five million year run as top killer on Madagascar was apparently cut short by the asteroid strike that fueled the Cretaceous tertiary extinction event 65 million years ago. Everything on Madagascar was wiped out because the ancestors of the modern fauna are all very different. One modern predator that shares some of Majungasaurus's physiology is the fearsome monitor lizard, Komodo dragon. There is a comparison, for instance, to the shape of the skull of the monitor lizard simply because it, too, is a very wide skull, and Majungasaurus is about as close as it gets to having a wide skull amongst uh, theropod dinosaurs. A wide skull means the ability to withstand extreme stress in a brutal fight. And so, the vicious, close fighting style of the monitor lizard the skull's strength to bite and hang on may echo that of Majungasaurus, and long after its extinction. Convergent evolution took predation to a whole new level, a predator with more than just the ability to bite and hold, but also a jaw strong enough to slice right through bones. Nothing, not even its owner's extinction, could keep it down. 22 million years after the dinosaurs went extinct, a new assassin, a mammal, proved so successful it terrorized prey across the entire globe. Unlike the two-legged theropods that ultimately evolved into birds, Hyenodon was a four-legged killer. Hyenodon's jaws made it one of the most lethal predators for 25 million years. It was a hybrid growing to the size of a wolf, around 100 pounds. But with the barrel chest and, more importantly, the robust jaws of a hyena, hyenodon hunted from 40 million to 25 million years ago, and its remains are found on almost every continent. Its secret weapon? Jaws. It was so ferocious that when it killed its prey, it wasted nothing. Not muscles, nor tendons, nor bones. In order to digest this tough material, it needed a way to grind it all up and get it all down. And that's where its monstrously powerful jaw came into play. I'm holding here the lower jaw of the large species of hyenodon, hyenodon hordus. This animal has large shearing molars here in the back position. These are the teeth it uses for slicing and for cutting tendons and for breaking bones. In all the modern carnivores, there's only one slicing pair of teeth. But in Hyenodon in particular, there were three carnassial pairs. So this is an animal that's highly evolved just for eating meat. 
Although the first jaws developed in the Earth's oceans some 450 million years ago had to be streamlined to make them hydrodynamic, on land they were better wide and short to contend with the torque involved in killing struggling prey. You're going to want a shorter skull, somewhat more rounded, that allows you to sort of withstand those, those bite forces. Best of all, Hyenodon had an ingenious system for self-sharpening its weapon. What happens is Hyenodon ages, these teeth have to remain constantly sharpened by wearing against one another to keep this blade sharp. As this tooth wore down, instead of letting it become blunt, it would rotate into the path of the other tooth, and each tooth would then wear against each other and slice this, sharpen this edge as they sliced against one another. One of Hyenodon's favorite prey was a small camel, Pobrotherium. This three-foot-tall herbivore was the size and speed of a deer. But Hyenodon was an ambush predator, built more for power than speed. So an animal like this is not a very swift runner. It would spend its time lurking in the vegetation, maybe on a patrol. It was mainly stalking and pouncing, perhaps with a short chase beforehand. It probably was using its body weight to knock the prey animal to the ground before killing it with bites to the neck. The critical component in this bite was Hyenodon's huge canines. They would have used these like a modern lion or a modern dog does to grab their prey, to choke their prey, to rip the prey open. And of course, like all predators, they had to fight battles with the members of their own species. And large teeth in the front of your mouth are a very effective threat display. It consumed everything, even teeth. Carcasses are often completely dismembered, heads are ripped off, limbs are ripped off. Hyenodons did a fair amount of bone cracking because a lot of their fossilized coprolites or fossilized feces have bone fragments in them. These animals utilize the carcass as completely as possible because they may starve to death if they don't. Hyenodon died out slowly, giving way to more sophisticated mammalian predators that evolved alongside it. They are gradually crowded out by the members of the modern order carnivora, the ones that include the living dogs, cats, weasels, bears. Today's foxes and wolves built on the success of primitive predators like Hyenodon. With shorter, lighter skulls and sleeker bodies, these modern carnivores maintained Hyenodon's jaw strength on faster pursuit predator body plans. A deadly combination. But big and burly is still a formidable one-two punch for any predator. And one heavyweight assassin added monstrous daggers to its predatory arsenal, the last thing its victims saw. This giant cat kept its killing tools front and center. No secret weapon here, just two of the most frighteningly prominent daggers nature has ever evolved. The saber-tooth design, it's been around for a long time, so perhaps as much as 35 or 40 million years. So almost any place you would have gone on the globe, you would have seen some sort of saber-tooth cat. Convergent evolution, the appearance of a single trait in different animals, gave saber teeth to many animals across the history of predators. It's clearly a successful design, so the question has long been, you know, what is it good for? The best answers to that question come from the most fearsome cat that ever lived, Smilodon. Smilodon's curved 10-inch canines were the leading edge of its attack. The rest of Smilodon's body was engineered for power. At five to 800 pounds, with thick bones supporting muscled limbs and a gigantic neck, it was massively powerful 
capable of speeds up to 40 miles per hour and taking down prey six times its size and weight. Why so strong? Because Smilodon lived during a time of giants, and to take down a giant, you've got to be powerful. Smilodon hunted North and South America for most of the last two million years, disappearing just 10,000 years ago. This period, the Pleistocene, saw the rise of the megafauna, huge animals like mammoths, ground sloths, short-faced bears, and bison. The American West was full of big herds of bison, and this would have been, I would think, a favorite animal for Smilodon. And Smilodon may have been capable of taking down large animals by hunting in packs. Cooperative hunting really requires some pretty sophisticated brain power, the reasoning ability to know uh, not only how to coordinate a group, but to actually know that you can maybe forego or delay your meal. been a very scary situation, I think, for any prey species to see a pack of saber-toothed cats coming at you. Closing in, the pack would pile on to the bison. But in this moment of attack, Smilodon would have been vulnerable. Predation is a really risky and dangerous business. Prey do not want to be prey. They resist, and, and consequently, struggling prey can, can hurt the predator. Smilodon could not go in for the kill until the pack fully immobilized the bison. Powerful forelimbs, capped off with punishing retractable claws, were designed for the task. They do have an enlarged dew claw that is set off at an angle from the others. So they've got you know, four hooks going one way and the other hook at a 90 degree angle. So if you move, it hurts no matter what you do. With the prey restrained, the Smilodon closest to the bison's neck would move in for the killing bite. And killing was particularly risky for Smilodon's sabers. With Smilodon, their sabers are very narrow from side to side, somewhat like knives, and so that makes them very vulnerable to being broken if they get a blow from the side or if they come down hard on something like a bone. The prey's throat was a vulnerable area that didn't contain bone that could break the big cat's canines. The Smilodon is likely to pull out a carotid artery, jugular vein, trachea. There's all kinds of vulnerable elements there that, once removed, cause very quick death. That would allow this animal to kill very quickly, which would protect it, or at least minimize the risk to it from being harmed by um, the prey. Would have been a much faster kill than what we would see in a modern tiger or lion. Tigers and lions are the closest modern analog to the saber-toothed cat. Though they are pack hunters like Smilodon, African lions use a distinctively different killing style. They actually use suffocation. They're either suffocating the animal by just doing a long hold for minutes on end on the trachea itself, so the windpipe, so that the animal can't breathe, and that takes them five minutes or more. Despite Smilodon's efficiency, it went extinct soon after the first humans arrived in North America, around 14,000 years ago. Human hunters started taking the preferred prey of Smilodon, such as mastodons and mammoths and bison and horses. Smilodon was so specialized to hunt big game that it couldn't change its behavior. The ability to be varied in your diet, to be something of a generalist, is a very effective strategy. It's, in a sense, a hedge against extinction. If you've got the ability to uh, take a variety of different uh, uh, sort of prey items. So sort of being um, uh, sort of a little bit of a Swiss army knife kind of animal is a very effective strategy. 
Convergent evolution rewarded Smilodon with massive, dagger-like teeth. But it rewarded another creature with one more deadly trait. The largest lizard of all time added lethal poison to its bite to make it the top assassin of prehistoric Australia. Eviscerating claws and fangs, muscular jaws, and brute strength. These are some of the most lethal weapons in the predator's toolkit. Tools that, through convergent evolution, survive and recur in nature's greatest killers. All of these lethal traits can be found in the terrifying Megalania, a heavily armed predator from Australia that was the largest land-dwelling lizard of all time. We're talking about the ultimate lizard. We are talking about the coolest thing on four legs and scales to have ever lived. Added to these powerful weapons was a venomous bite that gave Megalania a fighting chance to bring down prey much bigger than itself. Venom, first found on land in scorpions some 300 million years ago, has evolved repeatedly in creatures as diverse as jellyfish, insects, snakes, spiders, and even a few sharks. In Megalania, it was the final blow, the concealed weapon that would have proved critical in taking down something six times its weight. The active ingredient, an anticoagulant. So it's like the difference between having a dagger and having a poison tip dagger. In this case, it's exaggerating the effects of the teeth. Megalania was truly massive, reaching sizes of over 20 feet long and more than 800 pounds. Yet its heavily built limbs made it extremely fast. And along with razor sharp teeth, ample claws, and a venomous bite, it terrorized Australia from 1.5 million to 40,000 years ago. With Megalania, it's the classic case of when you have big food, you got big predators. The Australian megafauna were very unique. They were basically the largest of the marsupials, the largest of the lizards, and the largest of the birds. Like all lizards, cold-blooded Megalania couldn't regulate its body temperature internally, so it relied on sunlight to warm it up and make it mobile. But when Megalania had to be fast, it was fast. They can get up to speed quicker than just about anything else in nature, but at the same time, they've also got a top end speed faster than almost anything in nature. Today on the Indonesian archipelago, a distant cousin of Megalania still dominates the landscape. The best analogy for the behavior and ecology and physiology of Megalania is, is the Komodo dragon. These animals were probably very similarly proportioned. Megalania was four times as massive as today's Komodo dragons, but these modern lizards hold clues to how ferocious Megalania must have been. I've worked with Komodos in the field. They can run up a hill faster than I can run down it. There's no way you can get away from something like this. They are just machines. Once active after its morning warm-up, Megalania would search out a trail used by its favorite prey, Diprotodon, a 6,000-pound marsupial. Then it would find the scent of its prey with its long, probing tongue. These animals use their forked tongue to pick up odors, and it can sense what kinds of uh, animals have been passing that area. When it located a Diprotodon trail, it stalked its prey from the cover of the tall grass low to the ground, camouflaged, and capable of tremendous patience. Megalania, like Komodo dragons, would have been masters at stalking. My own experiences with Komodo dragons say that. These animals can be five, six feet away in the grass, and you just can't see them. At this point, all Megalania had to do was catch Diprotodon, sink his teeth in, and dispatch him. As soon as the herd passed, Megalania would strike with lightning speed. In the case of a Megalania, if it popped up, I would say 15, 20 meters away, there's no way you could outrun it. Uh, 
once it sinks these teeth into its prey, there's nothing much more than that animal can do other than struggle to get away from it. Megalania's teeth were serrated like a Komodo dragon's, but several times larger and more deadly. This is the tooth from a, an adult Komodo dragon, and uh, what's really interesting here is that you can see it has serrations on both the front and the back side. What happens is the protein fibers get pushed down in between the, those little serrations, and it creates really high stresses on the fibers and, and causes them to be cut in half. As that prey item would try to uh, bolt away, uh, the, the, uh, the megalania would either hold its ground or jerk its head back using its neck musculature and it would draw these teeth through the prey item and this would cause a massive uh, uh, furrow down through the body of the animal. It's ripped a huge hole in the animal, ripped a massive chunk of flesh out of the animal's side and now blood comes streaming out of it. Even a terrible injury would not have been enough to fell the massive diprotodon, but a dose of venom would have done the trick. The venom glands of megalania would have run along the insides of the jaws, just as they do in the Komodo dragon, basically in the mouth cavity here. And as these teeth caused uh, lacerations, the, uh, the poison would have been incorporated into the bite and therefore entered the victim. Everything is just a mathematical formula when it comes to a predatory attack. And this is something that just helps. So it's exaggerating the bleeding effects of the mechanical damage. So the animal, when it runs off, having lost a large chunk of its flesh, not only is terrified and scared, it's also losing a lot of blood and eventually will bleed out and die. Megalania, then all it has to do is tongue flick its way all the way to where the prey now lies dead and eat. And this hearty meal would have stuck to Megalania's ribs. It would digest the diprotodon fairly quickly, but the energy that it gets out of that meat and out of the flesh would last it for a long, long time. It would store the fat in its tail and over the ensuing years not need to feed. It's not to say that it wouldn't feed, it just means that if it wasn't feeling hungry, it didn't have to get out of bed in the morning. From lethargic behemoth to agile predator and back again. But despite its venomous advantage, this giant cold-blooded killer may have been doomed in part by a small, warm-blooded hunter, one without obvious survival tools that competed for food and may have even hunted Megalania itself. Could Megalania and its prey have been wiped out 40 to 50,000 years ago by early man? It's possible although no conclusive evidence currently exists to explain Megalania's extinction. Though all of these prehistoric assassins are now extinct, their formidable tools, their lethal weaponry, survive in predatory animals today. They've been refined, sharpened, and honed through the ages. But fundamentally, they are evolution's successes. So successful, in fact, that they endure beyond the lives of the species that wield them, to recur until nature finds a better way to kill. Oh.